Welcome to episode 20 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. I'm Tony, and the first thing for me to do, I suppose, is to apologise for the late arrival of this episode. None of us planned for it to be this late, but there it is. Now, back in December, Dave and Alan and I went to the Ubuntu Developers Summit in Mountain View in California. While we were there, we met up with Schwuck, who is our website design guru and a Canonical employee, and we interviewed several people, and this show we're going to bring you those interviews. We interviewed Matt Zimmerman, Matthew Paul Thomas, Robert Collins, Graham Binns, and Stuart Langridge. We've also got the result of the competition to win a copy of Ubuntu Kung Fu. Sounds like a fun packed show. Let's get on with it. Uh, we're here with Matt Zimmerman, who's the CTO of Canonical. Matt, what's going on here at UDS then? Uh, so there are there are lots and lots of uh, lots and lots of technical discussion. Quite a quite a lot of discussion about our community processes. And one session that I really enjoyed the other day, we had a had an extensive discussion with a huge room of people about what it's like to get into the project and, uh, and how we can make it easier for people to get involved who want to contribute. But on the whole, I think it's been it's been a great. UDS certainly uh, each one is an improvement on the on the one before, uh, but it's great to be in California. The weather's great, um, and I'm, I think it's going really well. What's the main thing that you wanted to get out of this UDS personally? Me personally, I, I mean, my, my my personal goal at UDS tends to be to try to make a positive contribution across everything that's happening. At least get involved in what each uh, team or group of people at the event is doing, and uh, you know, help make a contribution there in some way. So what does a CTO of Canonical do on a day-to-day basis? <laughs> I spend a lot of time on the phone, and when I'm not on the phone, I'm typing. And sometimes I do both at once. <laughs> about what sort of things? <laughs> uh, about all of, the, all of the engineering work that's going on in the company, uh, the various programs that we're doing, trying to uh, keep people communicating and make things happen. Excellent. Okay, so you've been with Ubuntu from the very start. How long is that, and um, what have you seen change over the distribution over the years? Wow. So uh, that's been, it's been about four and a half years. Um, so I was first uh, involved in discussions in the project in early 2004 and first came on board full time with the company uh, about mid 2004. So about about four months before we put out, out a first release. So um, I think most everything has changed since then, really. <laughs> the, uh, the, certainly the environment at the company has changed a great deal. We're orders of magnitude bigger than we than we used to be. Um, the process by which we decide what we will do, UDS and, uh, and the, all the associated things have, ch- have changed a lot. They're also a lot bigger and uh, require a lot more planning. The distribution itself has just grown by leaps and bounds, I think. Um, the original 4.10 Wardy release uh, was obviously a bit rough around the edges and put together very quickly. It was the first time for, for a lot of us in doing just this type of project from the very beginning. And um, nowadays, I think it's, uh, it's much more of, a, of a, a finished product. I know when you say uh, Warty was kind of rough around the edges, I know when I switched from uh, Red Hat to Debian, I was impressed with Debian, and then from Debian to Warty, I was you know, really impressed with Warty, and it actually felt right, which is why I've stuck with it all the years. Do you think there's still, given that Ubuntu, I think, has helped other distros to improve and raise their game as well, do you think, do you think we still have the edge over other distros? Do you think we can still pull people in from other distros? Well, I think uh, I think more and more it's uh, it's about bringing people into open source and computing more so than than between distros. I think Ubuntu is for many people their first introduction to Linux now, and that's something that I'm incredibly incredibly proud of. I think it's it's a a great first impression to make on people who've never um, never used open source software before. Going back to 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 Wardy, I mean, most of the the people who started using it at that time were uh, people who who had been using Debian and were looking for something which was a an improvement on that. And now it's you know, it's a, it's a first port of call for people who are who are looking for something new and interesting and open source. When Canonical was a lot smaller, did you have much more of a hands-on technical role? Um, and do you miss that if you don't do that so much now? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I used to write quite a bit of code. I'm not really doing very much of that anymore. Um, I still like to to experiment and uh, and work at a technical level, and I I, I, I do enjoy it. But it's a, it's a very different challenge, um, you know managing a large technical team and I enjoy that very much as well so it's you know I, I, I do miss it sometimes but uh, I certainly don't regret the the path that I've taken. Given Ubuntu is uh, 
comprised of a number of other upstream projects. Do you feel it's difficult to drive the direction of Ubuntu given you're dependent upon all those upstream projects? Hmm. So actually, I'd, I'd say I look at it more as, as an opportunity. But the fact that we have so much inspiration to draw from from all of these projects lets us see what's possible and what we, what we can do. And so more than anything, I think it's, it makes it possible more than makes it difficult. Now, we'd all like some extra development in certain areas of Ubuntu. Uh, is there a specific area or areas that you would like to see improved in the next release? One area that seems to be a source of a lot of, uh, of frustration for a variety of users is uh, the audio subsystem. Um, it's from, from the kernel all the way up to applications. It's, you know, it's overcomplicated. It's been, been done and redone in several different ways and uh, could really do with a, with a thorough cleanup. We've had some good discussions about it uh, this week and elsewhere, and I hope that there, there's some work to be done there. But I, th- I, I think it's probably going to be a slow process to get everyone to converge on a, on a, on a standard uh, API and, uh, and components there. But I think it does need to happen. It's, it's not in the state that we'd like to see it right now. So if sound is one way in which we can improve over, I guess that's going to be over successive releases of Ubuntu, what, what specifically are you looking forward to in this release? What's, what's uh, piqued your interest here at UDS for the jaunty cycle? Well, I think, uh, I think I'd say that if um, we can get the kernel layer right, if the basic ALSA API works well for you know, a majority of the people here at this conference, for example, I think they will have done a, done a good job. One of your other hats is also on the technical board, isn't it, Um, for the Ubuntu technical board? Uh, What do they actually do? So the Ubuntu technical board is one of the uh, the two uh, primary governing bodies of Ubuntu, uh, the other being the community council. So the technical board is responsible for the set of things that have to do with uh, technical standards and processes in the distribution. Um, We set standards for when we'll... uh, allow new developers uh, into the project and what their what their access privileges will be. And when there's a technical decision that needs to be made that's um, either someone needs some help or there's a conflict and it needs to be resolved, then they call on the technical board and we um, try to help them or, or, or take a decision where that needs to be done. Yeah. So in some ways, uh, either an advisory role or a decision-making role, yeah. Yes, I like to think so. Um, I mean, the as the the project has grown, the technical board's a very small group of people, and obviously, not all of the technical decisions that are made can go can go through that group. Um, but we try to to help out when we are called upon. Having been with Canonical since day one, basically um, over the last four years, do you think in another four years we'll have tackled bug number one? I think four years might be might be a bit ambitious, but I I, I certainly have high hopes uh, for the next few years in terms of um, continuing adoption of Ubuntu and becoming um, you know a real phenomenon in the the world outside of open source and people who who are just people who are buying netbooks and people who are buying consumer electronics devices um, getting introduced to it. I think that's the the next wave of of excitement that I'm looking forward to. I mean, this time, 18 months ago, I would never have predicted seeing Ubuntu on mobile devices. But they're everywhere now, and it's a really good team and a really, a, a really thriving area of the company. Are there any other new areas that you could see us getting into in future? Hmm. Well, there are, um, there are a couple of really interesting new uh, things going on at Canonical in that area. One of them is the, uh, the desktop experience project. Uh, David Barth and his team are looking at ways to... to radically improve um, the user interface and uh, experiment with some new new design concepts there. Um, and also I, the um, online services program, uh, which has been talked about some here at, uh, here at UDS, I think will offer Ubuntu users some really um, interesting and, and, and useful technology uh, that they don't have access to today. Okay, well, thanks for talking to us today, Matt. All right, thank you very much. We're here with Matthew Paul Thomas from the design team of Canonical. Hello, Matthew. What are you doing here at UDS? Many, many things. I'm helping with the design of various features in, in the installer and in the desktop and, and occasionally in the server. I'm involved in meetings of the design team itself and the desktop experience team that we're working closely with. What's there to design on the server? Well, the server team is currently in charge of everything to do with the virtualization, and there are some things to do with... Um, with setting up virtual machines that need to be easier. Uh, There are also details of the server installer that I hope to help out with. From my point of view, design sounds like putting buttons in the right place and colours and, you know, being very simplistic. 
I'm sure it's much more than that. What, what kind of considerations need to be taken into account when designing applications on it? Right. Well, there's, there's about half a dozen uh, factors that you usually consider in usability. Uh, there's learnability, how easy it is for someone who's coming across it the first time to use it. Efficiency, once you have learnt it, how easy is it to do something quickly. There's forgiveness, if you make a mistake, how easy is it to recover. And a- aesthetics and, and pleasantness, how satisfied is someone uh, when they've, they've finished their task. Some, sometimes these, these factors compete with each other and so you have to make a trade-off, but often they, they, you can achieve all of them at once. Uh, presumably you work quite closely with the, uh, with the artwork team. Uh, so who, who actually leads the direction with the artwork? Do they come up with ideas and bring them to you or do you say, hey, should we try this? How, how does that work? Well, uh, uh, Ken Weimer is uh, the coordinator of the artwork team. So far, the, the design team is so new, it's only a couple of months old, that we haven't really had much interaction with the artwork team yet. But I expect we, we will have have more discussions with them as we go on deciding on you know, what the splash screen should look like, what, the, what kind of backgrounds we should provide, that sort of thing. How do you find the interaction between your team and developers? I mean, obviously, you're sometimes going to be pointing out that developers are doing it wrong and they need to be doing it differently. And how, how do you find they take your uh, suggestions or recommendations? In general, it's, it's very good. Um, it's, it's all about the, the way you phrase it. I mean, when I started out in free software, I was in the Mozilla project, and I'll be the first to admit that, that the approach I took wasn't, wasn't that helpful a lot of the time. So I gradually learned that you need, you need to say, rather than just saying, oh, this is all, all terrible, you need to say, okay, well, if if you did it this way, it would be more learnable. If you did it this way, people would make fewer mistakes. And um, many of those things are, are like programming things. There's things like you know, refactoring to simplify the code it applies also to the interface. You can refactor the inter- interface to have fewer elements in it, to have fewer fewer entities in it, just like you'd have fewer variables in a program. And so, if you ex- if you explain it in that way, often programmers can understand it and. The Ubuntu developers, because Ubuntu is the, the Linux for human beings, of course, uh, they tend to be very keen on making it usable and making it making it a pleasure to use. Is there a different approach you take when talking with developers who are core Ubuntu developers or um, developers who are upstream outside the Ubuntu project, as it were? Yeah, well, with, with the Ubuntu developers, often they come to me and say, hey, um, I need to help with this particular feature, and, that, and that's great. With the, with the upstream developers... Uh, often it's me going to them and hanging out in their IRC channel and joining their mailing list and saying, um, you know, Ubuntu's considering doing something this way. Would you be keen on, on helping us out or, or doing it the same way upstream? How wide is your remit? Is it just to concentrate on the programs that are installed by default or the ones in main or everything that Ubuntu makes available? Uh, it's 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 even wider than all of those. <laughs> the, the the design team is is not just about Ubuntu; it's about everything that Canonical puts out. So also about Launchpad, Landscape, the Ubuntu dot com website, the online services, everything that that Canonical does. As far as Ubuntu is concerned, most of my interest is with the programs that are shipped by default. Partly in choosing which ones they are, partly in in trying to imp- improve their interface. So the effectiveness of a UI may influence whether that program is chosen over another one for inclusion in default Ubuntu installations? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I did in the last cycle was a comparison of Empathy and Pigeon, comparing their, their user interface and as well as their feature set and their maturity. And as far as the user interface was concerned, I, I came to the conclusion that uh, Pigeon was, was more polished, more mature, and that was one of the factors that led us to continue using Pigeon in intrepid rather than empathy. So is there a continual process of reviewing applications and no, nothing's got a sacred place in Ubuntu? No, I mean, that was, that was just the first example of it. You have to be careful not, not to just uh, switch too often. It, it, even if, if an application, one application would have temporarily overtaken another, you need to be careful that you're not causing too much churn amongst the user base. So it's, it's not the only factor, but it is a factor. So going from what you said there... I'm wondering whether or not we can expect to see Thunderbird anytime soon as a re- as a replacement for Evolution. Well, I I use Thunderbird myself. I mean, the 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 main problem with Thunderbird though is that it's not a not a GT, native GTK application. I I realise that Firefox has this the same issue, but uh, Firefox has enough of uh, 
a, a feature set advantage over Epiphany, especially with all the extensions that we consider it as the, the default browser. Also has the the branding. With Thunderbird, that advantage isn't isn't so great. Email is is a tricky problem for Ubuntu um, because when we're not really each of the the available options it has many disadvantages as well as many advantages, and so it's a tricky problem and. It's even if we wanted to put some development into it ourselves, it would be a, a a big hole to dig into. So, what sort of things are you looking at for Jaunty then? Many, many things. So, the the, the main things that we've uh, announced this week for, from the design team specifically and the desktop experience team that's implementing our designs is some changes to the the notification bubbles that pop up to notify you of things like new instant messages, that downloads are finished, that sort of thing. And to go alongside that, uh, a new panel applet to let you know that new instant messages have arrived, new email messages have arrived, so that we, you have fewer icons in the panel. You don't need one for Pigeon, one for Evolution, one for XChat. You can just have one that tells you, hey, there's messages that concern you. So that that's the things we're specifically working on in the design team for the cycle. There are other things that are, that feature teams are working on, like improving their partitioning in the installer, that sort of thing. That seems to be an area of uh, that's a bit fraught. I've recently had experience of a friend trying to install Ubuntu, and he's quite an expert technical user, but the partitioning screen completely confused him. Now, partitioning is not a simple task. How can you reduce that down and make it, make the complexity of having multiple partitions spread across multiple disks of different types, how can you reduce that down to make it simpler for someone to use? I'm not sure yet. And, and <laughs> part, part of, the, part of the, the difficulty of it, I mean, we've known this has been a problem since edgy, if not earlier, but any improvement in it would be quite a big undertaking. What I'm hoping to do this cycle is, is draw up half a dozen or a dozen different possible layouts how we, how we might present the various options. Then possibly do some paper prototyping, which means showing those to various users and saying, would you understand this? You know, what would you click to do this? And, and seeing how well they understand it. I guess we're in an unenviable uh, situation with respect to that because with Windows, you either get it pre-installed or it just wipes your whole disk usually. With the Mac, you get, you get it pre-installed also. So we're kind of in a bit of a losing starting position because we have this complexity of having to cope with multiple partitions already on the disk and, and adding new partitions, and that, that can't be easy, I guess. Right. I mean, the, the closest any proprietary system comes to this is uh, Mac OS X when you install Boot Camp, and all you have to do there is set up two partitions and decide how big you want each one. So the interface is fairly simple. For us, it will be more complicated. I mean, this is... I, I, I see occasionally people argue that, oh, you know, <coughs> Ubuntu is so much easier to install than Windows, and conveniently forgetting that in most cases you don't have to install Windows. So part of making Ubuntu easier to install is getting it on more computers pre-installed. That, that is part of the equation. And probably from a blank disk install, it is arguably easier than the Windows installer. But as soon as you have another partition, as Alan says, it just causes so much mayhem. If, they, if the installer can just take over the disk and just do what it likes, um, it's okay, but you've got swap partitions to set up. You might want to have separate partitions for your encrypted home directory that we may see in Jaunty, and it, it starts to become non-trivial, even if the end result is probably better. That's true. Yeah, the, the encrypted home partition is one of the things that uh, I'll be looking at either today or tomorrow to try and improve the design. And, uh, yeah, and one of the other possibilities, for example, is to to hide the swap partition option so that you would just specify a space for Ubuntu and the installer would choose the swap partition size automatically. That's that's one possibility that we're considering. That's, I think that's kind of what it does at the moment, isn't it? It says what it, sh what it would look like before and what it looked like, and it just says Ubuntu, a big chunk of space, and it doesn't actually say some of it is swap. So we're getting there. Yes, yes, we are. I mean, but then you still have the the advanced partitioning steps so you have they have the before chart the after chart that you can drag around and then you have the advanced chart which have three different appearances and one of the things i'm hoping to do is to to consolidate those and make them look more similar excellent well thank you very much for talking to us today and enjoy the rest of the summit thank you very much tony 
So we're here with uh, Robert Collins, who works for Canonical. And actually, Robert, I don't know what you do for Canonical. So uh, give us a rundown of what you do for Canonical. Oh, I'm on the Bazaar team. So I'm one of the principal developers for the Bazaar version control system. It's a collection of plugins. And that's kind of it. Although it's full time, there's no real opportunity at the moment to go and look at different things. For those who don't know, what is Bazaar and why should we care what it is and what you do? and how great it is. Bazaar is a revision control system. It's a distributed version control system which allows everyone to have the same power as you might get in CVS or Subversion where there's a trunk and only a few people can commit. In a distributed revision control system, everybody can commit. And they can do that on their own machines. It's got no risk to the people who are maintaining the project, but it lets everyone come up and be at the same level. It's egalitarian. You've all got the same access to the tool chain. You don't have a second-class citizen just because you're not yet a committer. And we hope that Bazaar will become a integral part of the Ubuntu toolchain because Ubuntu has a very large number of contributors, all of whom need to get their code into Ubuntu, but don't necessarily have the privilege of being able to put it straight in at this point. So the ability to access history for Ubuntu packages themselves is currently quite limited. And one of the things we've been spending some considerable time on in the last cycle and what during Jaunty is to get everything that's in Ubuntu, in BZR, and accessible on the web for any anyone to grab, edit, and then upload the new version. So it has significant advantages over traditional things like CBS or Subversion, but there are other similar tools like Git. Is that a leading question? <laughs> Not really. I don't know. Yeah, there, there's a, there's a bunch of distributed version control tools around today. The three most popular ones, the ones that turn up when people are doing selections, are Git, BZR, and HG. From a technical perspective, there are uh, more in common with each of these tools than there is different when compared to something like CVS or Subversion. BZR is very, very good at handling renames and tree shape changes where you rename a directory, add files, remove files, and the sort of stuff you do when you're cleaning up your code. Um, Git is sort of world-renowned for being fast. Someone did a blog post a few days ago talking about aiming a sniper rifle at your foot and pulling the trigger because you just don't realise you've done it yet. And he's he was using Git. He also uses BZR, which is why he's got a comparison. HG is a similar age to Git and BZR. It's, I think the thing they've focused on most in their development is their sort of patch queue workflow because it was developed by people who contribute to the Linux kernel, but they didn't want to use Git. So they have a workflow that lets them generate patches to be pushed out to Git quite easily. And was did BZNR start as a, an offshoot of something required by the Ubuntu project, or did it already exist? What's the history of BZR? Right at the beginning of Ubuntu, we recognised that scaling out package management and, and package editing to a vast crowd required the same tools that you use for developing individual packages, but at that scale. There was a choice at that point between a thing called TLA and a thing called Subversion. Subversion wasn't anywhere near as robust or as scalable as it is today. And TLA it was distributed. And distributed really, can't keep coming back to it, but it's a key social difference between systems. So TLA we started contributing to. Uh, I, I was hired to work on using TLA in Ubuntu before it was called Ubuntu. And we didn't get quite the traction that we needed. The tool wasn't quite what it needed to be. The Bizarre project was formed to say, okay, we're going to really focus on delivering what the Ubuntu users need and what uh, hopefully something that everyone will find really, really lovely and fantastic to use. And the current Bizarre code base was created when we realised the the design of, of Arch wasn't one that could scale in the way we needed it to scale. And there seems to be quite a lot of integration between BZR and Launchpad. Is that something that was designed from the ground up or something that's evolved over time? And also further, is is it really a requirement to use Launchpad or a Launchpad type tool with BZR, or can you get away with BZR on its own? So Launchpad and BZR are integrated by design. Um, a lot of Launchpad's code management stuff could have been done by you know inventing something completely separate, but... Launchpad wants to use BZR and work closely with BZR branches, whether they're hosted on Launchpad or not. Like the easiest way to get a BZR branch hosted is to just push it to Launchpad. Anyone can do that, free account, sign up, and it just works. BZR ships with integration with Launchpad, and that gets improved over time. 
it's important that Bezadar work well for people who are working on proprietary code behind firewalls and their own stuff. So it's got a full uh, capability without Launchpad. But Launchpad adds in social networking because you can see people who are working on the same project that you're working on. It aids with code reviews, um, bug management. You can say, I'll fix this bug over here, and you can get the code for it. So they fit very well together. They complement each other. A lot of people who are familiar with normal version control systems struggle with the concept of distributed. Why is it so good? It just is. Fair enough. Uh, There's a certain amount of, in the country of the blind here, I can describe it, I can describe it, I can describe it, but to have actually tried it and had the penny drop, it can be hard to get. We had at Foscamp here just last week, right before Ubuntu, the author, I think he's the lead developer, he's certainly very high up in the Bacula community, and he'd been trying to get to grips with Launchpad and to move off Subversion onto Bazaar. And we spent uh, an hour-long session where we were talking around a bunch of different things and we talked some stuff over with him. And during that session... You could just see the light go, ding, came on, he got it. And he said, okay, wow, okay, great. And after that, it, it all just worked for him. So there's, there is certainly a cognitive divide that you need to, to jump across as you learn a new tool chain. I think the advice I would tend to give someone who is learning it is to not worry about their own code, grab someone else's code that's already in Bazaar, something small, play with it, learn how the thing interacts, how the tools work rather than worrying about, I've got to migrate my stuff right up front before I can learn the tool. Or even just start with a completely empty project. Play around with it, junk, push it up to the launch pad and the plus junk directory where you can put any old crap that you want. And it should only take a couple of hours when you're doing something with no consequences if you get it wrong before you're completely comfortable. And then after that, get your own code and away you go. So you have a, a set of um, features that you've designed into BZR. Is there, are there any unexpected uses that you've seen that people are using BZR for? I haven't seen anything that was sort of stunning. I didn't think you could do that sort of stuff. Lars Vizanius has a habit of putting Bazaar right through its paces and, and ex- giving it extremely large workloads or deep history and things like that as an experimentation. He, d- he does that to find the limits of the system rather than really being a sort of useful use case. Um, I did as an experiment about six months ago, put all of Ubuntu's source as one, just, you know, unpacked all of the source into one big directory on disk and threw it into BZR. That could have worked better, and some of the scaling work we're doing now to give performance on normal trees would would add that sort of extreme case. If you want to store large binaries in BZR, how do you do it? BZR init, BZR add, BZR commit. Just the same as you would for any other type of file. Okay, and you make a slight change to that binary, and then you store it. Have you doubled up on yourself? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So basically, okay. So just so you put an ISO, I mean, off for okay. So just, so just no, so, no, we're doing a bloody interview. Yeah. You no, can... no, hang on, hang on. <laughs> okay, so if you put an ISO in there. Yeah, and then you did a reburn. Um, so basically, ninety percent of it is going to be identical. Um, then you're saying that if you replace that with one, like a daily image, it wouldn't restore the whole binary? That's correct. I didn't know Bazaar did that. Bazaar aims to just work. That's really the key thing. If it doesn't just work, it's a bug and we'll fix it. Bazaar can work with other version control systems like Subversion. How many more are there that can do that and how many people really using it that way? So the foreign tree stuff, the Bezidar Subversion plugin is fantastic. Most VCS systems have some sort of converters available so that they can get data out and push it into another system. There's a thing called Fast Export, which has become a bit of a de facto standard recently, and Bezidar supports that. Bezidar SVN is unique because it actually provides the Bezidar code at a model level, at an object inside their internal classes, direct access to Subversion. So you can run BZDAR log, you can run the BZDAR web viewer log ahead, or even the BZDAR index, but you can do a BZDAR index and then a BZDAR search directly against Subversion. And this works. It's obviously limited by the sort of resolution of the Subversion repository, and until recently they didn't even do merges. But these are, what it can infer from Subversion is exposed as first-class objects to our code. So all of the toolchain works. And, yeah, a lot of people pull stuff across. There's an entire mirror of all of GNOME at bezdarplayground.gnome.org. 
It's got everything in Subversion pulled directly across with Visitor SVN. It's a lot nicer than the other integration tools I've seen for SVN because they generally are wrappers around Git, so around EG Git or HG. You run this wrapper and it pulls some stuff out. And, okay, that's fine, but you can't just put an SVN URL in and have it work, which is what you can do with Bezdar. So you can Bezdar log SVN colon slash slash svn.gnome.org slash evolution slash trunk and it will just work. So can we talk to any more or is it just Subversion? Subversion is the most mature. There is a Bezdar Git and a Bezdar HG that Yelm of Uni is currently doing a bunch of work on. I, I can't really speak to their polish, but they're not at the degree of end user simplicity that Bezdar SVN is at. Bezdar SVN is probably the most important though from our perspective because there's a huge number of Subversion repositories out there that we need to interoperate with. Uh, one one thing I understand uh, that there are a few GUI front ends for BZR. Can you comment on any of that? There, there are. I mean, part of this is platform specific. Different platforms require different GUIs. Uh, there's a thing called TBZR on Windows, which integrates with the Windows Explorer, so you can right mouse click anywhere and it comes up with a context menu and, and so on and so forth. We do have some integration with Nautilus for that in the BZR GTK package, but due to some technical issues, it doesn't perform that well. There are there is a standalone GUI in the BZR GTK package called Olive, and there's a bunch of commands which will um, <clears throat> allow you to get GUI results out of BZR, but you fire them off from the command line if you're not using Olive. So Olive acts a bit like a file explorer, or a shell, a GUI shell. There's a thing called QBZR, which is a Qt-based BZR GUI, and, and a bunch of people like that. I believe it's been used as a sort of standalone GUI for Windows by quite a few people. There's BZR Eclipse, which is Eclipse integration for BZR. There's Gedit BZR, which is Gedit integration for BZR. What's that? NetBeans? I think there's a NetBeans project going along. I don't know how far it's gone. The list goes on. Cool. One last question. Bazaar or BZR? Yes. <laughs> I think we should call it a <laughs> knock it on the head there, actually. That's a good way to end it. My Thank you very, very, very much indeed. So, uh, in the last episode, we had a competition. And uh, what was the question, Tony? The question was, how many tips are there in the Ubuntu Kung Fu book by Keir Thomas? And we wanted to know the exact number, preferably. Or if nobody got quite the right number, we would take the closest answers. But fortunately, about 17 people got exactly the right answer. And what was the answer, Alan? It was 315. And the winner is Matt Bailey. So we're going to send you a copy of the book. Uh, the copy that we reviewed, so it's been thumbed a little bit, but uh, not too badly. Yes, and thankfully Matt seems to live in the UK, which is <laughs> makes shipping it a, a lot easier. So if you can email us your postal address, Matt, from the email address you use to enter the competition, we'll send it off to you. Which should mean we will post it within the next month, I expect. <laughs> We're joined by Graham Bins, who works on Launchpad. Graham, what are you doing here in UDS? So... Here at UDS, um, I've mostly been around to take a kicking from the Ubuntu community. Now, um, what I've actually been here for is to talk to all the different people, all the different tracks that are at UDS. So there's there's one for the kernel team, one for the server team, one for the community, yada, yada, yada. Um, and the idea is that I talk to them and listen to their concerns about Launchpad and try and um, find some solutions to their problems. Sorry, can you just uh, explain briefly what Launchpad is? Um, Launchpad is a collaborative software development platform. So it has um, a bug tracker, a code hosting service, um, an answer tracker, which is a bit used to build FAQs and um, and deal with help requests and stuff like that. It also does um, translations uh, and a number of other things. And it's used for all Ubuntu development. So whenever there's a release of Ubuntu, it's all managed through Launchpad. All the packages are managed in Launchpad, and all the bugs that are filed against the packages in Ubuntu are filed in Launchpad. And you work mainly on the bug tracker part of Launchpad, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, there are there are seven teams in Launchpad. Um, there's 35 developers in all, so it's roughly uh, five people to a team, um, each working on the different components. And yeah, my, my main focus is the bug tracker. Now, o- over the years, Launchpad has had some criticism for not being open source, um, but you had some, some news this week, didn't you? Yes. Um, um, so Mark Shuttleworth announced uh, at the last OzCon, which was last July, that Launchpad was going to be open sourced. And at this UDS, um, Kiko Reese, who is the um, the Launchpad uh, head honcho, um, 
announced that the date for Open Source New Launchpad will be the 21st of July 2009. Oh, you understand that was a surprise to you as much as us? Um, it did come up as a bit of a surprise, yeah. I mean, we, we knew that we were going to be doing the open sourcing within the next six months, but no one had actually put on date on it, and it suddenly comes a lot closer when somebody does that. I think, actually, Kiko sort of basically put, picked exactly one year after Mark made the announcement. Uh, I don't think there's any particular pragmatic reason for it. So what have you got to do to get it all ready? So the main problem with Launchpad to get it all ready is the fact that the, the code base needs a bit of reorganizing. Um, it's organized in such a way that it is kind of sane, uh, but it could be a lot better subdivided between the different applications in Launchpad. So bug tracker code should go in one place, translations code should go in another, and at the moment it's all kind of jumbled in together. And the one thing that we really want to do um, before we open source it is make it easier for people to contribute and to be able to contribute to it you've got to be able to understand the code base. Documentation wise it's it's pretty good um, so our main concern is just tidying things up. Now uh, when he announced that you also uh, spoke about the uh, new upcoming release now I mean to the end user they might not see a new release but I understand it's a big thing for you. Ver version 3? Yes, version 3 will be um, the release at which we open source Launchpad so we, we with Launchpad we do one release every month uh, more or less, anyway. Um, and the next, the next actual release of Launchpad will be two point one point twelve, which will come out um, sometime in the next week or so. But we're we're working towards the major goal of three point zero, um, which will start the the last six release cycles uh, this year. One of the major complaints about it is that it's very slow, particularly over high latency connections, um, say from South America or from Australia. Um, and we we need to do a lot of work on that. So we're going to be uh, rejigging the interface and hopefully doing a lot of work on the back end to, to speed things up. There's um, one part of Launchpad that's not going to be open source. Is that right? That's correct, yes. The, the back end to Soyuz, which is the software that builds all the packages for Ubuntu, um, won't be open sourced. Now, there are various pragmatic reasons for that that I don't really know the answers to, but one of the things that has been pointed out is that it takes an awful amount of infrastructure to run that. Uh, Canonical has quite a lot of servers um, just running the build farm for Soyuz. Um, I don't know if it's going to be open sourced in the future, but at the moment, the plan is to, to not open source that part of Launchpad. Is that related to the PPA personal package archives, or is that totally separate? Um, it is it is related. Yeah, it's the, it's the piece of software that builds the PPAs, but the, the code for actually uh, managing the PPAs and what have you will be open source. So it's, it's a bit of a fuzzy line yeah. uh, between what's going to be open and what's open source there. I was just, for myself, I, I don't have a problem with that because as far as I'm concerned, the ba major benefit of only sourcing Launchpad is for people to be able to help contribute code and also if people do need a an answer tracker or a support tracker for managing other projects, then I yeah, I think I think that's great. So But doesn't doesn't that mean there's a chunk missing? So if I if I cre if I take the code for Launchpad and I make my own internal launchpad for my company, which is a you know perfectly valid reason for using the open source version of Launchpad. I won't then be able to build Debs using the code provided using uh, Launchpad for my desktops and my servers. The There is kind of a solution to that. Um, my understanding of it, being a bug tracker guy, is a little fuzzy. But as I understand it, there is going to be some work going into making it possible to use an external instance of Launchpad to push stuff to the Soyuz build farm and have the Soyuz build farm do the legwork for you. But yes, the, yes, there is that argument. But again, it comes it comes back to infrastructure. Uh, and I'm fairly certain that if a corporation were to need that kind of infrastructure, they'd be able to talk to Canonical, and Canonical could work with them as a commercial partner. Is the Open Suzy one open source, their build facility? I have absolutely no idea about it. I don't think so. Because everyone's complaining about Launchpad not being open source, but neither is the Open Suzy one. This is true. So come 31st of July next year, once it's all, well, the bits that are going to be open sourced are open sourced, what will we'll be able to download and run for ourselves? To download and run, you'll be able to get uh, the bug tracker, the answer tracker, translations, management, um, all the 
the gubbins to deal with packages and projects and users. So basically, the the front end for Launchpad, everything you can see and interact with in the front end, you'll get. The stuff that you won't get is the the stuff that does the building of packages on the back end. But you'll still you'll still get the stuff as well for uh, handling remote bug trackers. The idea is that we will hopefully get to the point where different Launchpad instances can all sync with one another and there then becomes this blurring of the lines between what's tracked in one bug tracker and what's tracked in another and you'll be able to see the same bugs from any. And will it be branded as Launchpad still or will it will it be a generic installation or a, a generic product of which Launchpad is one instance? I'm not actually sure. We've had a lot of discussions about this and I think the current plan is to have the software... It's that we release called Launchpad and Launchpad.net be the canonical instance of that, and then each person can can use the can brand, rebrand it however they like. I think various things like trademarks will be will be kept. I, th- I think that Launchpad.net is a trademark of canonical, but I'm not 100 percent certain. So Graham, I'm sure you're sick and tired of talking about Launchpad this week. So what have you got out of UDS that's nothing to do with Launchpad? The thing I get out of UDS the most is meeting other people who use Ubuntu and talking about how we can improve Ubuntu. I don't do a huge amount of Ubuntu-specific development because I spend so much of my time concentrating on Launchpad, but um, I've spoken to a lot of people this week who are really scarily smart and had a lot of excellent discussions about how different bits of Ubuntu can be improved. I had I sat down today with um, John O'Bacon of the internet and... <laughs> Are you including him in the category of scarily smart? No, just scary. I, I would I would like to retract my earlier statement <laughs> for the purposes of bacon. Um, I sat down earlier with uh, the internet's John O'Bacon and uh, Celeste Lynn Paul, uh, KDE usability guru, um, and we had a conversation about how we can make usability more workable on by the common developer. Um, One of the things that often gets talked about is fixing bugs and fixing issues in software, but usability is a really hard concept for the majority of engineers to to deal with. Uh, And we were were having a a fairly in-depth discussion about how we can help free software developers work on usability issues, try new interface designs and work on usability experiments. And that kind of conversation you can only really have at UDS and it's absolutely fantastic place to be. And I understand you're going to be inflicting your musical skills on us at some point. Yes, yes, yes I will. (laughs) (laughs) What what do you play? I play bass uh, and guitar and a couple of other things that we don't have here. So it's going to... Tomorrow night it's going to be bass and guitar. Um, we're going to we, we've got a set list, but the last time we had a set list in Prague, it got completely ignored. So I suspect you might find some invention going on on the stage, which is never a bad thing. Um, once again, I mean, you wouldn't expect it at a free software conference, but I'll be playing on stage with the internet's John O'Bacon of Severed Fifth fame. Although I did discover. Uh, on Tuesday night, that he only knows one note, um, and but I'll be, I'll be playing with the the scary musical genius that is Luke Yelovich, um, who plays the drums and the piano frighteningly, frighteningly well, and I'm sure we're all going to have a great time. Now, Graham, I understand uh, you're doing a podcast for uh, for Launchpad. Can you tell us about that and where we can get that? Yeah, uh, Matt Ravel, who is the Launchpad um, community and documentation guy, uh, and I have been doing uh, Launchpod <laughs> um, for for quite a while now. Um, you can find it at news.launchpad.net. It's released hopefully every week, um, sprints and other things interrupting occasionally. Um, and what we what we tend to discuss are new Launchpad features, where things are going, and we, we try and interview people who are using Launchpad in new and interesting ways, uh, as well as talking to the different Launchpad developers. So it's actually quite a fun-packed show. <laughs> Whoa, that's trademarked. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for talking to us today, Graham. Thank you very much. We're here with Stuart Langridge, who is a canonical employee, or will be a, a canonical employee, yeah. and also used to be on a podcast, I think. <laughs> I did used to be on a podcast, yes, but obviously not as good as yours. No, obviously wow. not. We have that on tape. That is a quote. That is a quote. So, what are you doing here at UDS? 
They asked me to come over and meet up with my team for the first time, see what was going on, participate in some of the sessions, that kind of thing. <laughs> what area are you working in at Conical? Online services. Now, can you tell us much about that? No. Okay. <laughs> so, what have you made of UDS? It's been really interesting. I mean, one of the things that I think is interesting about it is that it's a conference which is genuinely for work. Most conferences, you know, you go and you, uh, you watch a talk, so you do a talk or whatever, and people will sit around in the hallways and chat, but... It's very much an experience to be there. But here there's much more an atmosphere of people are genuinely here to work. People will have sprints while they're here. You're, um, you've got people in sessions who are explaining stuff because it's their job to do so. So it, it feels much more like something which is genuinely actually part of your job rather than a, a jolly away from your job. And the bizarre thing being that some people are paid to be here by Canonical and there's a whole bunch of people who are community people who aren't paid to be here and volunteer to come absolutely i mean that that i think is is great i've sat in on a couple of the community sessions because for the first time i'm seeing this from the other side you know part of the ubuntu community yes now nearly i'm a canonical employee so i get to see this from the other side of the fence and you think wow there's loads of people here who are not canonical employees it's strange what do you make of the of the atmosphere in places like the community room obviously you know some of the people in there but there's a lot of people i guess you don't know i i I know a fair few people but there's an awful lot of people here i don't know there's an awful lot of people here who i've spoken to or emailed or whatever but i've never met to me the atmosphere the atmosphere in the community room seems more chatty than the other rooms Um, The other rooms are very, very technical, very uh, detail heavy. There's a certain amount more of geeing people up to talk about stuff. Whereas the community room is very much more a kind of bantery thing. I mean, some of that's because I think John is running it. Um, some of that is because it's the community room, so the subjects they're talking about are inherently less technical. Somebody did say that there was an almost a lug radio style ding dong kicking off between you and John at one point. That's because John is wrong about the nature of process. But, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean that was entertaining actually. I think I, I, I mean I tried to avoid doing that kind of thing too much, obviously. I heard that Jono was the inspiration for the XKCD cartoon where it says that somebody's wrong on the internet and <laughs> if you hover over it, the tip says, actually, it's Jono. <laughs> so what are the other sessions you've looked at, the uh, non-community ones? I've sat in on a couple which were, frankly, a bit too technical for me. Because this is my first UDS, I've got no real idea of what's relevant, what's heavily technical, what isn't. And I wasn't here for the first two days anyway because I was on a sprint with my team. So when I came, I went to a GDM session. I thought, oh, it'd be interesting, find out what the new version of GDM is like. And a lot of it was... Sorry, uh, can you just explain what GDM is? Uh, GDM is the thing you log into. Um, when, you, when you start an Ubuntu machine, or start a GNOME machine, you get a, uh, the login screen. That's GDM. It stands for GNOME something manager. Desktop manager. Desktop manager. It is desktop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I thought it was display. Ah, uh, you see, I thought it was display, and this is why I didn't say anything. <laughs> so now you look like a pillock, and I don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so that's GDM, and there's been a reasonable amount of work around making it cooler, different, prettier, whatever. Merco Muller's been working on something to make it cooler, I think, and there's been various blingy bits. So I thought, oh, I'd like to sit in on that, maybe see some cool screenshots, get an idea of what's coming. And it devolved into a very heavily technical discussion about different X servers that it starts up and so on, and I thought, ooh, you know, I mean, not their fault, absolutely, I was just in, in the wrong session. It's quite interesting to me, because although there are little bits of announcement and things like that in some of the plenary sessions. For a lot of it, it's just people who've got a very technical brain sitting down and discussing the details of how they're going to implement something. And it's more about them having the convenience of being face-to-face than it is about thinking up brand new ideas and making publicity-seeking announcements. Yes, I mean, that's exactly what I meant by this feels much more like a conference which is about work. It's not about canonical people saying, this is what we're doing to community people. It's much more, let's all get together and hash out what we're going to do over the next few months rather than what we have done over the previous few months. Some of the sessions do actually get you involved as well. I I sat in on a very small session about Wubi, the Windows Ubuntu installer, and there was only two guys in there and I walked in and they were you know quite willing to you know all huddled around one laptop and show me what was going on and what's new and stuff and we all discussed some of the options for improving the product and it's nice to feel that being invited here you you have some input so you know even before you've started working for Canonical you have input to you know what what the product the next version of the product's going to be absolutely i i went this morning uh to the mobile round table there's a round table session every morning um, and I went to one of the mobile tracks. I know I know nothing about the mobile stuff, but I'm quite interested in it. And I just thought, I'll just sit at the back and watch, see what's going on. And the chap running it... Who's... So I was going to say, what defines a roundtable session as opposed to any other session? 
the table is round. Um, <laughs> now, the, the, the round table sessions don't appear to have a specific agenda, agenda in yeah. mind. I mean, for some, as far as I can tell, there's a round, round table session every morning on every track. So some of the tracks have said, this morning's, you know, Monday morning's one is going to be on this topic, Tuesday morning's one's going to be on this topic. But there's no specific agenda or goal in mind. It's more, let's talk about this subject in kind of a hand-wavy way. So I sat in this morning on the mobile one, and the chap was kind of going around the table saying, what have you what have you seen over the last few days that you think would be relevant to the mobile stuff? And he asked me, and I said, I'm just here to watch. He said, no, 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 what have you seen? Like, you know, forced participation. <laughs> um, but I said, you know, I've seen this and that and the other. Um, and he said, oh, right, cool, OK. And then they got into a discussion about um, different clocks. Um, <laughs> oh, was this related to KDE? <laughs> Well, the thought did cross my mind, to be honest with you. But it's more kind of what applications do we want to see on the mobile stuff and uh, and more what um, applications will we like there to be and then is there an actual existing application to fill that slot? From what I found, the community one uh, was very excited. There was a lot of um, like emotion in there when people were talking. You go from there into something like the server room and everyone's calm, collected, and just taking very slow interchanges. You know, and there was no talk of network block devices, which I know you love. I mean, you should you should come in. I mean, absolutely not interested in the network block driver. Um, I think, to be honest with you, that's though because community stuff is first of all something that everyone can genuinely participate in, and secondly, it's something about which is inherently more emotive anyway. If you look at um, the GDM session I was in, say, there were only three or four people talking in that because only three or four people had the requisite level of knowledge to actually contribute to the discussion. Yeah. Whereas the community thing, they say, well, how do you feel about the idea of the Ubuntu Hall of Fame? Say, everyone can have an opinion on that. I have no opinion on whether GDM should start up a separate X server or not. Don't know. Trust the people who are doing it. You do it. That's fine. As long as I can type in my username and password and log in, that's fine with me. But I do have an opinion on how the Hall of Fame looks and how it should work. I do have an opinion on Canonical's relationship with the community. I, it's a slightly different opinion now I'm part of Canonical. But. It's also nice to be involved early on just knowing what's going on. I, I was in the encrypted swap partition session and you know I had very little, if anything, to contribute to the discussion, but it's great to sit there and know what's being planned for the next version and have some kind of idea of what's building up for the next version. Do you find that you've learned stuff about what's going to be in Jaunty or what might be in Jaunty. Yes, completely. I mean, that's why I think Tony's videos thing is interesting because people who can't be here for whatever reason, they didn't get sponsored or they don't live in San Francisco or they didn't want to blow £18,000 on flying here or whatever, <laughs> can still find out. It, it's kind of a, a sneak preview yeah. almost. I mean, I'm surprised there aren't more people who are here purely to find out, but I suppose the Ubuntu community and to some extent Canonical don't want this to turn into Macworld. You know, it, it, it's not here as a pretty marketing demo of all the cool stuff that you get your hands on if you're prepared to pay. It's here so you can say, I think we should have this cool stuff, and then everyone's going to say, well, how? Excellent. So what's the major thing you're going to take away from this week? Cool, that's, cool, that's a hard question. Free T-shirt? I say, apart from the T-shirt. <laughs> oh, well, apart from my free T-shirt, hooray. That's not the major thing I'm going to take away. <laughs> come, all the way to, come all the way to America, get a free T-shirt, go home again. Uh, I, I'm, and I may leave my voice here while I'm here. Major thing is the sense of purpose, I think. I didn't realise, like I said, just how much this is work. It's actually... It's, that's, that's not to say that it's bad or it feels like, you know, a drudgy day at the office, because it doesn't, not at all. Um, but the sense, of, the sense of purpose that people they have... You know, everyone who thinks, oh, well, there are six sessions on now and none of them are really relevant to me. See, the guy doesn't hack on stuff. Um, I've had the chance to meet up with my team and they're all a great bunch of guys, you know. So that's what I think I'm going to take away, the, the fact that I've met everybody and now I know we're doing well. Excellent. Thank you for talking to us. Thanks. No worries. Well, that about wraps up Season 1 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. Thanks for joining us over the last 20 episodes. We're going to be taking a break now, but in the meantime, you can join us on Twitter at twitter.com slash uupc or identica, identi.ca slash UUPC. Or you can find us on Facebook. Search for Ubuntu UK Podcast. You can continue to send your emails to podcast at ubuntu-uk.org where we welcome your suggestions for the show, recorded material, tips, reviews and rants. Or you can leave us up to 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845 508 1986. If you're into IRC, you can find us on hash ubuntu-uk on the Freenode IRC network. 
It only remains for me to thank our mirrors, bitfolk.com, Nafalo, and Martin Meredith. That's all for now. Bye-bye. (laughs) 